There you go. And then go ahead and bring your, yeah, you're good. You're, you're no, live, you're recording, well. you are ready to start. So go ahead to PowerPoint. There's your screen that I think you want there, that one. And just keep half an eye on that one because you'll have people that'll show up periodically and just admit them. Yeah, this is the. That's not the chat though. Yeah, this is the Zoom. That's just the Zoom people. That's just telling you who's in your room. And yeah. um, so there is a different. So if you go up here, chat. Yeah, you can click that. And that's the chat feature. So if you want, yeah. you don't need to. <clears throat> nobody really chatters with you. Yeah, and I might. Um, so I'd say periodically maybe click it. But yeah. you are live on Facebook right now. So I'd say go ahead and get started. But I need to be on. Wait, where do I need to be? Go for that black screen. Oh, that's my presenter mode. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I was getting confused with Zoom. Zoom. Nope, this is you. Okay. All right, well, are you going to go listen to me? Make sure they can I hear am, me. I am, so right. you'll see me. I'm going to make a quick announcement out there. Okay. I think I'm good to go here. Um, if you see me talking to my computer, it's because we're actually live streaming this presentation right now. Uh, so everyone in the world, anyone out there on the internet can watch me give this presentation and see the same pictures that you're seeing. Um, so I kind of have two audiences. You're the ones that took the time to drive here and show up in person. So I, I really appreciate that for you coming out to the museum today. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. And unless I get any objections from my, my coworkers about uh, the live stream, I'm gonna uh, pretend that everything's okay. Um, sometimes we run into some technical difficulties. So my name is Ben. I work with the education staff here at the Maritime Museum. And what I have planned for today is one of our Maritime Heritage Lecture se uh, Series programs. Um, you can see the title slide. I'm going to cover screw pile lighthouses of North Carolina. Uh, so this lecture series runs throughout the year, uh, the off season, if you will, fall through spring. We tend to do more of them because we're a little less busy here in the building. Summertime, we're very busy here dealing with many other things, so we don't do as many. Uh, but myself and some of the other staff here at the museum put on a, a wide variety of lectures, um, cover many topics because maritime history uh, is very broad when it comes to subject matter. Um, and and I that's what I really enjoy about it. 
because I can pick almost anything as long as it's related to North Carolina's maritime history. And this one definitely is. So what I have set up is a slideshow presentation. I'm, I'm gonna be running my mouth over here. Um, <clears throat> got lots of images and uh, this is kind of informal. I, I'm trying to monitor uh, maybe some questions that come in over the internet, but really I'll, I'll probably have to put those off towards the end of the, the program just to make it easier on myself. But if you all have questions out here in the auditorium, uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, I'll make sure to try and get to you. I'll also promise that I will not make anything up. Um, I don't claim to be an expert, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I wanna you know, do my best to answer your questions. Um, so uh, you guys are in luck today because this is a brand new presentation that I've been working on and put together. Uh, I kind of rotate some of my some of my lectures just to give a chance for everyone to have the opportunity to see them but this is a brand new one i've really enjoyed uh, <clears throat> finding the images and, and researching the material to present to you uh, i i may not um it may not go as uh, smooth as i would wish because it is the first time so please bear with me if it's a little bit bumpy um, i'm also hosting the zoom meeting right now where people are watching over the web so um, I'm tending to those guests uh, at the same time. I'm just ad admitting people to the Zoom room uh, and they get to watch me here. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. Um, screw pile lighthouses in North Carolina. Here's a satellite image of our coast from the Virginia border to the South Carolina border. North Carolina has a very uh, watery coastal plain with ocean beaches that a lot of uh, tourists and vacationers and, and folks are familiar with. The vast internal waters or the sounds and, and the wide coastal rivers. Um, we know that early light towers were, were used along the immediate coastline out along the ocean's edge. Uh, and these were used to warn seagoing vessels about the dangerous shoals and sandbars, uh, the Diamond Shoals off of Cape Hatteras and the uh, Cape Lookout Shoals. Um, maybe you can, no, I don't want that. I'll do a laser pointer. Can you see that red dot? There we go. <clears throat> There's Cape Lookout Shoals and those Shallow sandbars extend off of those points there, frying pan shoals down here at Cape Fear. So if you think about the early years before we became a country and, and even afterwards on, on up into the 20th century, most everything was moving by ship. And if you were going from north to south along our coast, you had to go, uh, you know, whether you're going from Baltimore to, to Charleston, or maybe you were going from Savannah to New York, you had to go around North Carolina. And it was a very really tricky place to to, to sail, especially when you got here off of Diamond Shoals, you had the convergence of the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current meeting there and making very treacherous conditions. So, so lighthouses along the coast were, were meant to help guide those, those ships. Um, there were navigational aids inside too. When I say inside, I mean like the Pamlico Sound and the Albemarle Sound and these rivers as well, the Moose River, the Pamlico River. Um, so let's delve into this a little farther here. Um, I know everybody loves lighthouses. So I put in a couple slides here because, because I could probably got some lighthouse fans in the audience and watching online. Um, but you know, I'll admit I'm a lighthouse fan myself. Uh, I've always enjoyed visiting the lighthouses of North Carolina and any other ones that I happen to to see in my travels. Um, so this was early light tower locations in North Carolina. Now these were some locations that had some lighthouses built. Uh, and these were some of the earliest ones in, uh, in, in our country. Um, and yes, you can see the dates there. So some of these locations have had uh, later towers built uh, for some reason or another. Uh, for example, the first body island lighthouse, I think it, it leaned too much and they worried about it falling over. So they built a second one and then the second one was destroyed by Confederate forces as they were retreating. 
Uh, so then there's a third one. But that first one at Body Island was built in 1847. Um, if you look down here at Cape Lookout, our first lighthouse at Cape Lookout nearby was built in 1812. Um, but take a look at some of these other ones, Pamlico Point, there was a lighthouse built right along the shore at the mouth of the Pamlico River in 1828. Uh, there was a lighthouse inside Ocracoke Inlet built in 1798. And there was a lighthouse, and actually several, built inside along the Cape Fear River in 1849. So they weren't just on the beach, it didn't have to be just on the beach. Uh, so here's a little lighthouse quiz for all us lighthouse fans out there. Uh, what's your, wh where are these light towers located? And maybe you can take some guesses there in your head. Um, in some of these, there's only drawings that exist. There weren't any cameras around at the time. Not everybody had the cell phone to snap pictures. Um, and then some, there's a couple of photographs in there as well. So uh, let's see, that's where, that's where they were located and it tells you when they were built. So Shell Castle was at Ocracoke Inlet. There's the first, a, a drawing of the, the first Cape Hatteras lighthouse, a drawing of the first Cape Lookout lighthouse. And there's a picture of the oldest lighthouse still standing in North Carolina. And then there's a picture of the lighthouse at Ocracoke and a picture of the remnants of light, the lighthouse on the Cape Fear River Prices Creek. Um, which ones are still standing? Well, you probably know by now, um, because maybe you visited some of these or maybe you saw, seen them from a distance. Um, so that, I'd throw that little, to appease the lighthouse fans out there. Uh, and it's really a misnomer because it is a, they were light towers. They weren't lighthouses, they were towers. The, the lighthouse keeper didn't live in the tower. He lived in a house beside the tower, usually, at least here in North Carolina. So when you say, oh, we're going to see the lighthouse, we should probably rephrase that and say, I'm going to see the light tower. Um, there is a house nearby where the keeper, the lighthouse, the light tower keeper, see, I'm guilty of it myself. <laughs> I did it for however many years, and now I'm trying to change my habits. Um, so we're going to see some real lighthouses here in a second, some actual houses with lights on top people lived in. Um, I wanted to throw this image up here. This is of a light ship. So I say light ships and buoys could be anchored at locations where light towers on land would be too far from the navigational, navigational hazard that they were trying to warn mariners about. You could, you could not have a light tower built out on Diamond Shoals. They tried it. They, they, did, they did try it. They tried to build a light tower out there on Diamond Shoals. It didn't really work out too good. <laughs> Um, so they anchored these ships, and if you see up there, that's where a light would have been, way up top up there, and they pretty much, you can see the anchor lines set out, so this is just a drawing here, but um, so light ships were anchored at these, strategically at these places to, to help mariners navigate. Maybe they couldn't see the light tower on land in bad weather, it was too far away from the extreme uh, uh, tip of Cape Lookout Shoals. Um, but they used light ships in the sounds as well, um, in Pamlico Sound and Albemarle Sound. Um, so I, I wanted to put these couple of articles that I came across, um, and this was the early time frame of uh, the, some of these light vessels and uh, event, and then later on the locations would become screw pile lighthouses. But so the top article on the left is from out of Raleigh, and that was 1824. And I just wanted to show you how, what all these, what types of navigational aids were existing. Yes, we have a question here, Mike. Yeah, about the, the light shows. Um, were those guys staffed at your end? Or they, they, I assume they were staffed. Uh, yes, he had a question for those listening online. And a gentleman had a question about the staffing of the light ships. Was it year round? And yes, people were on the ship and they were year round. They usually uh, had a certain amount of period where they were on duty and then would be relieved and someone else would come out there. Um, so yeah, you were basically just bobbing up and down in the ocean. <laughs> and another question, yes. How were they? Early light ships only had sail power. 
um, or how are, oh, how is the, yeah, oil, oil lamps for the lights. His question was, how are the lights, how did they turn them on? It wasn't a battery. It wasn't, you know, it was, it was an oil lamp, just like the oil lamps in the, the light towers. Um, early years, they, they even used some whale oil. Um, and then it became kerosene. And so there was a transition there of the types. So, okay, back to these articles here. So we see that, that article, the upper left. Um, so it was talking about some of the navigational aids. A light vessel will be placed on, at or near Long Shoals on, on Pamlico Sound, um, cost $10,000. A lighthouse, so that other one was in Florida, but here's some in North Carolina. The other article on the bottom right is from 1852. Um, and it lists all these places that were getting different types of navigational aids. Uh, Jones's Fog Bell placed near Bald Head Lighthouse at the entrance of the Cape Fear River. Um, $2,600, uh, seems expensive for a fog bell, but I, I don't know. Um, a harbor lighthouse on the east end of Bogue Banks. So there was actually a light tower structure on the east end of Bogue Banks one period. Um, two buoys to be placed in the mouth of the Alligator River. That cost $200, $100 a buoy. These were pretty big buoys. Um, for a buoy to be placed on the northeast end of Fal Falker's Shoal in Croatan, Sound, buoys to be placed in North River in Kernsuck County, uh, first class light boat to be moored on frying pan shoals um, under the direction of the superintendent of the Coast Survey uh, to be built on the most approved plan and model, uh, four large buoys to mark the two channels over frying pan shoals. Um, so just to give you an example, um, it wasn't just the light towers out there helping people get along sail around and navigate. There was many other types of aids. You may go out on your boat today and see the channel markers and stuff like that. So it really was no different. Um, so talking about those, those light ships anchored out there, here was an example of uh, Diamond Shoals. You can see the red star indicates where the uh, first offshore light ship in North Carolina was placed in 1824. Obviously this, proved to be a treacherous location for an anchored vessel, as we talked about. Um, and it only sat out there for about three years. And from 1827 to 1897, there was nothing marking the outer uh, diamond shoals off of Cape Hatteras. Uh, and, and in that time period is actually when they tried to build a, a, a light tower out there on the shoals. Um, in 1897, they, they uh, had a new, new uh, sturdier ships built and anchored another light ship out there. So uh, these were some locations of light ships in the internal waters of North Carolina. Um, but you're gonna see that a lot of these locations became screw pile lighthouses. Um, so I marked them with the, with the letter and you can see what's, what, what uh, area they were, they were there marking, uh, Ocracoke Channel, letter A, um, Long Shoal up here on the western shore of the Pamico Sound. Um, and I have the time period of when there was light ships at those locations. So pretty much all of these locations uh, become a screw pile lighthouse. Uh, it was, they were, they were, it was a design that we're gonna learn about here that actually came from Europe. Um, this is a drawing of the early screw pile lighthouses uh, that was designed uh, in, in Europe. Um, this was a idea put forth by Alexander Mitchell and he was actually from Ireland. Uh, he designed the first screw pile lighthouse in England in the 1830s. Uh, and I have a little bit of details there on um, the composition or, or the structure itself. The, these pilings were 36 inches in diameters. Uh, timber and they were with had a cast iron screw pile device on the bottom. They were driven 15 to 20 feet into the sand or mud. Um, and a capstan was used to turn the screw pile. And that was done by human power and strength, um, sometimes requiring up to 30 men uh, to, uh, to install those. Uh, came across this image and, and I don't know the date on it. Um, and then, but this is showing you what the bottom of that screw pile looked like. It was a helical type or auger type uh, screw that 
had a piling on it and would go into the sand or mud. I, I, I don't know too much about uh, the specifics on it. Um, so hopefully nobody quizzes me on it. I'm still learning about this as, as I do my reading and research. And I, I thought this was interesting because it kind of shows you this type of barge over the water and the capstan here and the men all turning, you know, turning this around to, to screw the piling into the substrate down here underwater. I want to give you a better idea. Um, and they proved to be pretty sturdy structures, uh, waves and, and, and such, and storm surges could, could go around them uh, without too much of a problem in, in the ships. It was a lot more comfortable to be stationed out there instead of on a light ship uh, for the people that were responsible for keeping the light going. It didn't do any good if, if the light wasn't going. So maybe it's kind of like that old Motel 6 commercial, we'll keep the light on for you or something. <laughs> yes, Grant has a question. I don't know. I think it's a chain. So he's asking about in the picture, there's, there's a uh, chain depicted. It looks like some type of chain that comes down to the... Uh, um, screw down here at the bottom of the piling. And I don't know if it was something that was coiled around it when they lowered it down. And as they uh, spun, spun it around, it became uncoiled. Maybe it was to help steady it or something in a way as it, as it sent, they lowered it down to the bottom. I don't know, I have to, I have to definitely have to do more reading about that. Um, so these screw pile lighthouses were, were just a, we're, we're better than, than being out there anchored in a boat that was getting beat up by the waves and bobbing up and down. And uh, So this drawing is of these, a early style that was built in the United States. And this is actually a drawing for the Roanoke Marshes lighthouse. And we're gonna see some pictures of that soon. But I wanted to kind of tell you, give you a little background on the structure itself for, for here in the United States and a little bit about um, the screw pile lighthouses that, that we were, were, we had here and we should be are more familiar with. So um, a lot of the, the building type part, the framework and everything for the top, the house structure was actually prefabricated in Maryland uh, and then sent my barge or, to, or ship to the location where it would be uh, put on top of the pilings. Um, we were second in, in number anyway, uh, to, <clears throat> to the Chesapeake um, <clears throat> region for a number of screw pile lighthouses. The, their internal waters and estuaries uh, uh, had a lot, a little bit bigger than ours. So they, so they required a few more of the, these screw pile lighthouses. Um, and I have a note there that most of the early structures in North Carolina would get rebuilt around 1880 and you know, you know, even they were exposed to the elements and, and had their had uh, force weather forces that were making life difficult for, for, for even those structures. Um, most screw pile lights used a fourth order Fresnel lens or fourth or a fifth order to magnify the light source. So this Fresnel lens, if you're not familiar with the light towers like Cape Lookout and Hatteras, this is the type of lens that was developed and installed in these light towers to help project the light out as far as it possibly could by a series of glass prisms that were arranged in a way to, to really focalize it, get a focal point of that light and project it out. Um, so this uh, fourth order lens is about 28.43 inches tall. Uh, and this is actually from an exhibit in the main gallery. You can walk after the presentation and go look at it uh, in real life. Uh, it's, behind, it's behind some other glass here, so you don't touch it. Um, but that's, that is actually the one in the gallery is from a screw pile lighthouse that was on the Potomac River, the Maryland Point uh, screw pile lighthouse. Um, so some lighthouse towers on land had a first order lens that were way bigger than the fourth and fifth order lenses. Um, Another drawing here to kind of set the mood for a screw pile lighthouse and, and what it might have looked like. Um, so the light would have obviously been up here, the highest point, 
Uh, and actually in the drawing, you can see the, a bell over on this one too. And that's the fog bell that would have been rung in poor visibility conditions to alarm sailing ships that, hey, you're getting close to something dangerous and shallow, um, you know, get away from this noise, <laughs> basically. Oh, and here we go on the inside, um, lighthouses were assigned a head keeper and an assistant keeper. And this is the floor plan of where they live there, the main floor of the, the structure. Um, keepers would assist mariners as best they could, but like any lighthouse or light tower, um, their main job was to help with navigation. They couldn't respond to a, a shipwreck as easily as the life-saving crews uh, or later Coast Guard would be able to. Um, so, but sometimes they might have uh, helped out with, with ships that were in distress. Um, they might have helped offering uh, to tow a boat or to repair uh, and such like that. Um, so it was a, typically a head keeper and an assistant keeper in, in, at the station there. But if, the, you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't supposed to, but they could bring their families to the station and spend some time out there. Um, especially if the families were nearby and they could they could sail and pick them up and bring them out to the to the station. Can you imagine it would be you, know, you would probably miss your children and your spouse and um, having to be stationed out there uh, and over the water. <laughs> uh, and and I came across some interesting articles that for communities that were nearby on the shore, uh, they would it was it became something that they actually do that was like a, a weekend thing that was fun. They would get in their boat and sail out to the screw pile lighthouse in the sound and, and meet with the light keeper and uh, talk to him and chat about things and uh, maybe share some news. Or if they had uh, friends coming to town and visitors, they would take them out there to show them. It was, it was like an attraction almost. Um, right here are the locations of screw pile lighthouses in North Carolina. Um, and I'm going to go over these in, in a little more detail. So, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but you can see it pretty much matches the locations of the early light ships uh, along our coast and the bulk of them being in the Pamlico Sound area and the Albemarle Sound area. There's large uh, distances and expanses of water where there were still shallow sandbars and conditions could get pretty rough, especially for smaller craft. So I put them in order of when they were established, uh, when the screw pile lighthouses were built. Um, so you can see the first one would have been at Wade's Point up here near the Albemarle Sound. And then the last one was built was at Bluff Shoal out here in the Pamlico Sound. Um, but we're gonna zoom in on these and uh, we'll take a look here at the Albemarle Sound area. So first we get Wade's Point, the mouth of the Pascotank River, we get uh, Roanoke Marshes down here at the southern end of the Croatan Sound, uh, Croatan Shoal, the northern end of the Croatan Sound, uh, Roanoke River off there to the west, the mouth of the Roanoke River, uh, North River. This is a different North River. There's several of them in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, there at the, uh, on just west of uh, the Currituck mainland peninsula, um, and then Laurel Point on the south side of the Albemarle Sound. So those are those are the locations there. And now I've got some pictures of the of each structure, most of them. Um, and it got really confusing for me because a lot of them look the same. <laughs> and you're going to see the, some of the same pictures. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I, I, I convert you to fans of screw pile lighthouses and, and you don't get sick of seeing pictures of them by the end of the presentation, but I really enjoy looking at them. And, and sometimes there's something interesting that you see in each picture. Um, you know, for example, why, what is this? Why is this structure here? Uh, well, let's learn about the Wade's Point screw pile lighthouse um, and give you the location of it, four and a half miles east of Wade's Point there we saw on the map. The original 1855 structure was actually not a square building, it was hexagonal um, in, in nature. Uh, and I have a picture of one of those later. Um, 
the house was burned by Confederate forces in 1863 as they retreated. So that was an attempt to uh, extinguish and do away with navigational aids to make it harder for Union forces to sail in to the internal waters of North Carolina. Um, the house was rebuilt as a square gable structure um, that in 1867, but then a that house, uh, that structure was eventually done away with and we had an 1899 one that we see here. So that's why this is the base, this is here, this is the base of the, of the uh, original structure um, to, the, to the right of the picture there. Uh, so you can see they, they had a boat that was up on davits there that they could launch and get around with. Um, there's where the light would have been at the top, obviously. They had the staircase to get up there. Uh, you can see the fog bell that we saw in the drawing. Um, now, it, another interesting thing happened, you can see in this picture, when you look at those pilings, in the winter of 1917 and 1918, frozen water broke the pilings. It got so cold that year that ice flows were, were moving along the Sound and River and broke the pilings to the structure. Uh, lighthouse keeper Joseph Mercer had to evacuate and he walked to shore. He couldn't, he couldn't row or sail to shore, it was all ice, he walked. <laughs> um, and the structure was eventually repaired. Uh, it was later abandoned around 1940 and replaced with a, a smaller lighthouse structure that, that nobody, nobody lived in it, but a, a nearby lighthouse keeper could go out to and maintain. Um, what happened to that, that, that uh, actual building? Um, well, it was decommissioned and in 1955, it was sold for $10 to Elijah Tate. Um, and unfortunately, while he was attempting to move it to land because his idea was he would set it on land and somebody could use it as a house, uh, it, a storm struck and the, the building slid off the barge uh, into the Albemarle Sound and was unsalvageable. So the, the Wade's Point Screw Pile Lighthouse, the house itself is at the bottom of the Albemarle Sound somewhere. Unfortunately, but you can, in this picture, you can see the pilings and where they were broken from the ice flow. So that's pretty wild that it was that cold and the ice was, was that much of a problem. Okay, moving along, Roanoke Marsh's Lighthouse. Um, this was also built in 1857 as a hexagonal building. Uh, that was deemed unsafe and a new square building structure built in 1877, 100 yards south, southeast of the original location. That too was decommissioned. Uh, and when I say decommissioned, it means that they they did not uh, they did not use it anymore. Um, it was replaced by something else. More than likely, whoever was in charge of it may have retired, and they didn't bother hiring someone else to be stationed in there. Um, and they might have gave gave authority and, and the responsibility to one one particular or you know several a few maybe maybe two people to kind of like maintain all the lights in the, in the area just by sailing to them and not actually living um, in the structure. Uh, this one too was also bought by Elijah for $10 and uh, it was lost in a storm. Well, I don't know if it was the same storm. Um, so the picture that you see on the right is actually a replica of the, uh, the, the lighthouse um, and it's on the waterfront of Mania. And this is actually a sailboat that's kept up there at Mania, but it comes down here quite a bit for our guys across the street at the Watercraft Center to do repairs on it. What's that? The call? Yeah, yeah, so thank you, Grant, is uh, our Watercraft Center manager. And that shad boat that you see right there, it's the Spirit of Roanoke Island or something, maybe is the name of it. Spirit of yeah, it will be here for our wooden boat show, and you'll be able to see that particular sailboat. But, um, so you can tour the lighthouse there on the Manio uh, waterfront, and that opened in 2004. Um, so I mentioned in the previous slide that it, it was those, so a lot of those structures were decommissioned and you ended up with these, a skeleton structure. I couldn't find too many pictures of them, but this is one that was uh, put in around that time period down um, in uh, Key Largo, Florida. So obviously nobody lived on that tower, <laughs> but there was a light up there that had to be maintained for navigational purposes. Uh, so here's Croatan Shoal. Um, <clears throat> and I have those, those notes on, I'm not gonna spend all the time reading all of this to you, but because uh, in, in 
it is being this is being recorded. You can watch this on our website, on our YouTube channel at a later date. Um, I don't want to keep everyone too late, um, but there is something I want to read pertaining to the Coatan Shoal Screw Pal Lighthouse, and it's a newspaper article that I got came across, and it was printed in 1927 uh, from the Independent out of Elizabeth City, and it talks about the lighthouse keeper that worked at the Coatan Shoal Lighthouse. And I'm not going to read all of it, but I highlighted some, and this will give you a glimpse into what it was like to be a Screw Pal Lighthouse Keeper. So. The title of this article is 40 Years in a Lighthouse. Captain Ephraim Meekins closes a remarkable career. Keeper, 36 years. And I'll read some of this article. One, I found it amusing. Two, I found it informative. Uh, three, I hope you enjoy it. How do you think you could get along with a wife after living alone and away from her for the better part of 40 years, and then to go home and start out all over again? How would a wife get along with a husband that she hadn't seen more than one or two days a month? If he suddenly showed up after being 40 years a married man and announced that he had come home to live with her. Captain Meekins has been living alone in Coatan Light for many years, out in the middle of Coatan Sound. He could sit and read and smoke his pipe after his day's work was done and never have to move from his chair until time to throw some coal in the stove. There was no wife to complain about the ashes on the floor to make him stir while she tidied up the room. The Meekinses raised six daughters, but the captain never had the chance to play with them at evenings and jump them on his knee. Instead, he was alone in the lighthouse, tending the light and looking forward to the next day off. So in a way, they're saying, you know, he didn't, he didn't have to worry about what he was doing, but at the same time, he missed a lot of time with those six little girls uh, that were his. Um, Mrs. Meekins says, she thinks she'll be able to get along with the old man because she will find plenty for him to do and expects to keep him at it. For nearly 40 years, she has been keeping the home spotless, raising six children and helping to raise her grandchildren. She believes she will have time to rest now that the old man is home. She knows he's a good housekeeper for he had to keep the lighthouse tidy and he had to cook big, his, his meals. Captain Ephraim might have expected to retire when he came ashore, but his wife had other plans. Captain Meekins entered the service June 4th, 1887 as assistant keeper of the Croatan Light, serving until March 24th, 1890, when he was made keeper. In 1900, he was transferred to Hatteras Lighthouse, the tallest on the American coast. So they moved him around, lighthouse service. He might've been working at one place or another. Um, <clears throat> and he stayed there until October 1, 1906, when he was moved to Body Island and on August 9th. 19th, 1919, he went back to Croatan Light and he served as keeper there ever since. And boats became old friends. It's a great life in a lighthouse, says Captain Meekins. You never have the chance to get lonesome. Beside all the regular run boats, there are 203 yachts each winter that pass the light. Just like they do today, all well, the snowbirds headed south, I guess. A lot of them stop at the lighthouse for information. Sometimes they just wave a whiskey bottle at me in passing. Only one of them has ever offered me a drink. But there are thousands of boats that go by during the year. And so this is a direct quote from Captain Meekins. And they salute you most of the time. Lumber barges, barges, steamers, pleasure boats, all of them become old friends that you look for from time to time. And if they are a little late, you wonder where they are. They change crews often and give you a chance to meet new people. You may not actually shake hands with them, but you learn to know them and like them. It is harder just like anybody that follows the water. There is something about the water that draws people close together and makes them lasting friends in spite of their differences. Life in a lighthouse will make most anybody a better man. Any line of work on the water requires so many favors of a fellow that he soon takes special delight in favoring people. There isn't a soul on earth I wouldn't do a favor for, and there is nobody I would lift my finger against. I would have liked to have met Captain Meekins. He sounds like quite a nice fellow. But that gives you a little idea of what it was like to be stationed out there, these screw pile lighthouses. So I'm gonna talk about the Roanoke River Lighthouse. And as you can tell, this is a modern image. This is a replica structure uh, modeled after the 1866 lighthouse and it's on the Plymouth waterfront in Washington County. Um, the original 1866 structure first was uh, 
destroyed by a fire in 1885. And then a new house that was slated for Croatan Shoal was sent to Roanoke River instead and built on the original 1866 piling. And then in a year after that fire in 1886, ice flow broke two pilings and the structure fell into the water. So they had problems with ice on the Roanoke River too. A new structure was built in 1887. And look at the architecture. It's a lot different than those uh, square ones in the hexagonal structure. Um, this was built in 1887. It was decommissioned in 41. And Elijah Tate makes an appearance again and he buys it for $10. <laughs> this is the going rate for decommissioned screw pile lighthouses, apparently. Uh, and that was in 1955. Uh, what did Mr. Elijah Tate do this time? Remember, it happened to the other two he bought. Uh, he learned from his mistakes. He sold it to Em and Wiggins for the same price of $10. <laughs> and, and Wiggins said, uh, I, can, I can handle this. So he puts it and drops it onto an old military barge and he moves the structure to Filbert's Creek near Edenton where he sinks it right there on the barge in the shallow water and then he fills the whole area around it with dirt. You can't really do that today. <laughs> There's coastal management laws in place that would frown upon that, but that's what, that's what Mr. Wiggins did. And there's the residence that he lived in for, for some time, pictured on the left. Uh, that, that's an awesome picture. And I would love to, who would not have loved to have lived in something like that? Look at that. Uh, well, they had to move it again. Uh, and that was in 1995, the Edenton Historical Commission said, you know, we really would like to have this in Edenton on the waterfront. It's a historic structure. Uh, and in, in, in 2007, they had it moved there. Uh, and, and, but restorations were not completed until 2014, but you can visit this is, as far as I know, uh, the only or original, historic, still standing, um, fully restored uh, screw pile lighthouse in North Carolina. I find it interesting because it's the only one that I came across that was of that architectural design. Um, there's another one I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, but it's hard to uh, discern what part is original or not. Um, so, Here's the one at the North River, the mouth of the North River, originally built 1866. That same cold winter took its toll on the North River uh, screw pile lighthouse in 1917 and 18. Ice uh, broke the pilings. And look at these two pictures because one is before the ice and one is after the ice. Um, and you look at the, at, it's, it's shorter. So you think of it like, well, may, well, maybe it's high tide or low tide. Well, we're, we're talking about this, the North River where there's like, a tidal difference of, you know, maybe half a foot, maybe maybe less, maybe a little bit more. I don't know. So it wasn't a tide. I guess it could have been a wind-driven tide event. But no, it's lower because uh, the pilings broke and it just kind of settled a little bit lower. And they said, "Oh, well, it still works. <laughs> we'll just keep you keep the uh, lighthouse uh, Keeper and his assistant there, and they can keep using. They they use it a, a little bit longer, but it, it was decommissioned in 1919, uh, which is weird because it's back then it sold for 150 dollars. They got ripped off, um, but it was it was bought by the Dare County Schools, and uh, it, the superintendent R. C. Evans of, of the schools he had an idea. He said, "Well, we can use this as a schoolhouse in Rodanthe, and it was moved there in 1920." And it served as a schoolhouse until 1951. Um, it's still there. Uh, it eventually became the Rodanthe Wave Salvo Community Building or Community Center. The original, the, so the screw pile lighthouse, the structure, the house is somewhere in here. <laughs> and I can't quite figure it out. I'm thinking that maybe one of these roof lines is the original. Uh, could be that one, could be that one. But over the years, They've added on to it and renovated it, and it's very hard to make out what was the actual uh, screw pile lighthouse. But you can see it's used as, as uh, for community events, there's a playground, there's a skateboard park. Um, there's the Pamlico Sound back there. Uh, this was a picture I came across in the newspaper, Island Free Press. But, um, so if you went there, you could say that you went to a screw pile lighthouse, but uh, it's doesn't really look like one. All right, okay, here's a hexagonal structure. This is Laurel Point on the southern shore of Albemarle Sound. This is a great picture because here we're in a sailing vessel and we're coming up pretty close to the lighthouse. Um, 
I don't know what the occasion was of this picture, but it, if it's, it's a it was in the Coast Guard archives, and that could have been a Coast Guard vessel that was coming for some reason to the lighthouse. Um, I, I don't know. And depending on the time period, it, it, well, yeah, I don't, it could have been a uh, revenue cutter, Marine, Marine Revenue Cutter Service predecessor to the Coast Guard. Um, so there was another cold winter besides 1917, 18, and that was 1892, 93. Seven of the pilings of the Laurel, the Laurel Point Lighthouse were broken by ice, but the, um, the station was still solid. Repairs were made in 1893. More damage from ice occurred the following year. Uh, what you see in this picture is after those events, they put these wood pilings around the structure um, to help break up the ice sheets before they hit the main pilings of the lighthouse. That's what those are for. Um, this structure was decommissioned in 1931. Unfortunately, the building was destroyed in 1950, but that's a good picture of a hexagonal uh, structure there. Uh, all right, let's move to the Pamlico Sound and I'll go through these. Uh, Northwest Point Royal Shoal. So that's uh, almost in the center of the sound, west of Ocracoke Inlet. Uh, Southwest Point, um, Long Shoal up there on the northern end, Oliver Reef closer to Hatteras Inlet, uh, Gull Shoal back across and closer to the mainland, and then Bluff Shoal down in between. So if you see, this is a chart that I have here. It was marking like the, the, uh, <clears throat> the main route, the um, waterway there. You can see, so some of those are, are along that point to help ships maybe follow along the waterway um, for navigating. So here's a picture of the Royal Shoal. Um, <clears throat> so this one had a problem, not with ice. It was in a little bit warmer water, I guess, out in the sound, closer to the ocean. Uh, but it had a problem with scouring of the sand around the pilings. If anyone spent time on the barrier islands along our coast, you know, the sand is pretty easily moved by wind and waves and currents and tides. Uh, and that's what, what happened here at, at this location. So the scouring caused uh, you know, some concerns that the structure may, may fall into the water. Um, and, and that was around 1889. So there were supplementary pilings installed in 1897, additional repairs in 1899. But eventually it was, it was a structure was too unsafe and the keeper of the Royal Shoal Screw Pile Lighthouse was moved to the, the, the Northwest Point, was moved to the Southwest Point uh, Lighthouse. In 1901, there were funds for replacing the Northwest Point uh, structure, uh, but they were diverted to constructing a lighthouse at Bluff Shoal instead. I think uh, a lot of the, the, the um, local mariners and even those with the lighthouse service said, you know what, it's going to We'll be best off with just rebuilding with building one over here at this location. Um, so the Northwest Point structure was was discontinued after Bluff Shoal was established in 1904. Um, so I don't have any pictures of Southwest Point. Uh, I mean the Northwest Point. I have a picture of the Southwest Point that we see here. Um, they were pretty pretty close in proximity. Um, I think the Southwest Point was completed ten years after the, the Northwest. Um, it was discontinued in 1927 and replaced with one of those skeleton towers. Okay, here's Long Shoal, about nine miles south of Stumpy Point. Uh, uh, interesting uh, experience for the, the keeper there, the lighthouse keeper, Thomas Baum. He woke up on December 24th in 1920 to very loud banging around and he went out onto the deck and he looked and he saw about a dozen barges that were all tied together, had got tangled up around the pilings. <laughs> it's quite a way to wake up in the morning, a bunch of barges banging on, your, on, the, on the structure there. Um, <clears throat> so he had to figure out what was going on with that and, and remove them because it could have gotten uh, detrimental to the, to the structure itself. So in this picture you see, I mentioned earlier about how like families could maybe come out to visit and it, we see a, what a looks like a, a, an adult man here on the uh, deck here. But we also see this looks like a child in the picture. So I don't know what this occasion was and if that was family 
more than likely. Um, All right, Oliver Reef will move over here towards Hatteras. And this actually uh, was known as the Hatteras Inlet Light. It was officially though the Oliver Reef um, Screw Pile Lighthouse built in 1874. And I'll zoom in on Oliver Reef there. So in this picture, this is, that is, there's Oliver Reef and that right there is marking where the Screw Pile Lighthouse was. So this was used to help ships that were coming in and out of Hatteras Inlet, they could, they could, whether they were coming from the west, they knew that this was deeper water in the lighter area on this chart, um, or maybe when they were making their way through the channel here in the inlet, they knew how to line up and, and then avoid this uh, shallow sandbars here. Because when we zoom in, these soundings are in feet. This is Pamlico Sound, 13, 14 feet, drops to three feet, two feet, there's one, one foot. You can't sail a large vessel over something like that. You're gonna run aground. So that, that right there is marking where the Screw Pile Lighthouse was at Oliver Reef or Hatteras Inlet. It was discontinued in 1926. I've put this article up here. This was from the Progressive Farmer out of Winston, North Carolina, March, 1895. And it's talking about something kind of unrelated it's talking about a new oyster regulations on where oysters could be harvested from in the Pamlico Sound. But I thought it was interesting because they were using these screw pile lighthouses to indicate locations and help the commercial fishermen, the fishermen know what areas were off limits. So we'd use them as boundary markers. And if you scroll down and read down in there, um, we can see that it says, uh, you know, here's the areas that might have been allowed or, or off limits. Um, it says first area from Pamlico Lighthouse to Ruse Marsh, thence to Shell Point and thence to Southeast Point of Great Island and thence to the Brant Island Lighthouse um, and then back to the uh, beginning. Uh, second area from Gall Shoal Lighthouse, then to Gibbs Shoal Buoy, then to Long Shoal Lighthouse, then to Gall Shoal then to Gull Island, then to Oliver Reef Lighthouse, and then back to the beginning. So they were marking areas in the sound that were, would either be open or off limits. But I thought that was interesting. That was in the newspaper, and that's how they found about where they can and can't be uh, harvesting the oysters from. Um, all right, so Gull Shoal, we're moving along here. This is on the western side of the Pamlico Sound. There's Wysocking Bay, if you're familiar with that. So this Gull Shoal Screw Pile Lighthouse was out here actually off the chart, but you can kind of see it. You can see Gull Shoal, seven feet, five feet of water. A little bit on this side, you're in 16 feet of water. Um, and on this chart, it tells you you had a fixed uh, red light, 44 feet above the water, invisible to 11 miles, and there was a bell. So these navigational charts gave you that information. Um, it was a hexagonal structure. It was decommissioned in 1926, replaced uh, the skeleton tower. Um, all right, Bluff Shoal. Here's a nice picture of the Bluff Shoal Screw Pile Lighthouse. You can see the keeper up there posing for the picture. Probably pretty proud of his lighthouse. It's like Captain Meekins taking care of it, keeping it tidy. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read this one, a little article. Yes, sorry. Oh, question. Okay, so automated, I, I think it means, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the, that light um, at that point was just on its own. It didn't have to be, the only thing, it, I don't know if it, it wasn't powered by oil, it was powered by something else maybe. Uh, and maybe that, so that it went on its own, the person in charge of it, taking care of it, probably had to at least go and just make sure it was still operating if it broke, something broke on it. Um, that's a good question. I need to do more research on that. So some of them are hexagonal, some of them are square. Is, was there some geographic determinant as, as to why some would be hexagonal or, or rectangular? And was there any identifying markers on them like there are on the lighthouses? Uh, that's a good question. Color. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. We, um, so we had a question from the audience here in the auditorium about the structures and why some were hexagonal and some were square. To answer that, 
I think it had to do with who got the contract to build it <laughs> and maybe the cost. Um, they were put in at, at different time periods. And it seemed like some of the hexagonal ones came in a little bit later than the early square ones. Um, but then even after, then they went back to the square ones. Uh, so I think that probably had something to do with it. Uh, and then another part of the question was, were there any day marks? When we think of a light tower like Hatteras and Lookout and Body Island, they're painted different black and white patterns. Um, these screw pile lighthouses tended to be, the, the, the house structure tended to be white, but sometimes the shutters and the roof and the pilings were different colors. Um, but I don't think it was intentional to be as a day mark. Um, because sometimes the roofs were red, sometimes they were brown, sometimes they were green, and the same with the shutters. Sometimes the shutters were red or brown or green, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I didn't think about that until now, and so I'm gonna go back and look at that and see if there is anything to it. Does it make sense? Um, you know, you, it, it, the, the light towers on the coast, the light towers had a pattern of the light flashing, and they had a light pattern, or, and then they had a paint scheme, which is another way to tell where you were. So it makes sense, sense to me, why wouldn't you do that out there in the Pamlico Sound? You had a, a light and maybe the color was different to let you know where it was, or the flashing pattern was different or whatever, but why not have the actual structure itself help you determine where you are too? Especially out in the Pamlico Sound when you see nothing but water around you. I mean, there are no landmarks nearby maybe to help you discern where you are. Yes, another question. You would think so. She had a, we have a question uh, again from the audience about the, the hexagonal structures, if they were less prone to wind damage. And the theory, I guess, maybe you're thinking is that the wind would go around it a lot easier than a square building. And that's very possible. Um, maybe some of those, maybe, uh, maybe when they were designing those, that's what they had in mind. Um, but that's a good point. Um, okay, let's, uh, all right, I, I wanna read some excerpts from a, another article here and I'll try to go through it pretty quick. Um, again, this, this, is, this is a little bit later than the other article I read. This is 1950 out of the Carteret County News Times. Uh, and it's talking about the keeper of the lights along the shore. And it happens to be another article about a, a screw pile lighthouse keeper that's retiring. <laughs> so I, felt it, I kept coming across these articles and I was like, this is great stuff because it's firsthand account from these lighthouse keepers about what their life was like. So what better way to document it and record it and then share it with you guys. Um, so keeper of the lights along the shore. There are but a few of the old time lighthouse keepers left. Actually, there is no longer need of them in this day of automatic controls. Captain Joe Burris is a relic of the old days. For 16 years, he was a keeper of historic Ocracoke Lighthouse. For a total of 45 years, he was a keeper at some Virginia or North Carolina shore or sound lighthouse. Now, nearing the age of 75, he is retired. During his years of service, he was stationed at various lighthouses on the reefs uh, or in the sounds of Virginia and Carolina. Um, in North Carolina, he was stationed at Croatan Screw Pile Lighthouse and Oliver Re Oliver's Reef and Bluff Shoals. Uh, lighthouses out over the water in the sounds have been replaced with automatic lights, but in the old days, a keeper was stationed at each to care for the oil lamp light the foghorn equipment, and 40 to 45 buoys or beacons in the sound. They, these were lonely assignments, lasting sometimes several weeks until a change of keepers. The buoys and beacons had oil lamps and had to be checked frequently. Before the days of motorboats, a sailboat was used. Lighthouses in the sounds were built on steel structures 40 feet above the water at depths of about 15 feet. There was a kitchen, a living room, and two bedrooms, and a porch all around. No cellar no attic, no icebox, no electricity, and no wife. A wood stove in the kitchen, a coal heater in the living room, water caught off the eaves in rain barrels. All fuel, food, and other supplies brought out by boat when the keepers exchanged shore and sound stations for a period of time. Visits permitted. With special permission, the keeper's family could make brief visits to the lighthouse during the summer months. Mrs. Burris and the six little Burris children and their family pets would get into the sailboat or the motor launch at Hatteras to make the 30 mile trip out to Bluff Shoals. Getting the youngest children and the pets up into the lighthouse was sometimes a task. 
The dog was lassoed and pulled up by rope. The kitten was carried in a basket or a bag. And Captain Joe tucked the baby under one arm as he swung up the ladder. <laughs> the, the kitten goes in the basket, the dog in the lasso. Captain Joe Burris grabs the baby and flies up the ladder. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know how Mrs. Burris felt about that. But, uh, maybe she was happy to see, see her husband. Uh, with, with, with the other children, Mrs. Burris climbing cautiously after him. Visiting days were happy ones for, for son Austin, the oldest child, since they gave him an opportunity to fish for big trout off the lighthouse porch or to sail the skiff, or sometimes accompany his father in the motor launch on his rounds of buoys and beacons. Permission only in the summer months, winked Mrs. Burris with a twinkle in her brown eyes. But once we all went out on Christmas day and took the tree, the presents and the Christmas dinner. Ice bound, it was out at Bluff Shoals Lighthouse that Captain Burris was once an ice bound prisoner for 30 days in the last big freeze. That of December, 1917, January, 1918. Pamlico Sound was frozen over the end of 20 days, Captain Joe was down to flour and water. Starving didn't bother him so much, but his tobacco was gone. So he took to two and boat caulking as a substitute. Finally, at the end of 30 days, the ice began to break up and anxious friends from Ocracoke and Hatteras came out in motorboats with fuel, food, and to his delight, chewing tobacco. Life today is more eventful in the world abroad, but less eventful at home. And this is a quote from uh, Captain Burroughs. The, the, the great event of each day used to be climbing the spiral stairs at sundown to trim the wick, fill the reservoir, polish the reflectors and light the lamp. Today, my days are more like the trip back down the spiral stairway. So he was retired. I'm really glad that someone decided to write an article about that and to kind of paint the picture, if you will, all right, let's move to the southern southwest Pamlico Sound real quick. We got the Noose River light, the mouth of the Noose River, the Brant Island Shoals out there, north of Cedar Island, uh, the Harbor Island light. So these are the ones that are closer to Carteret County where we are. So that's at the confluence of Core and Pamlico Sound and then Pamlico Point Lighthouse. And remember that one started as a lighthouse on a light tower on land. But eventually they built a screw pile lighthouse out into the water. Uh, the Noose River Light, here it is. Look how high up that one is. Uh, it, was nick it was nicknamed, I don't know what that beeping means. Probably something bad, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, so that was completed in 1862. It was nicknamed by the locals the Grasshopper. And I guess they said because it had really tall pilings out there. Um, had a fifth order lens. Uh, the roof caught on fire in 1872 in the kitchen. There was a kitchen fire. They repaired that. 1882, several windows up at the top were broken out by flying ducks. Um, they repaired that. 1920, 400 ston tons of stone were placed around the base of the structure to prevent ice flow damage. Uh, and eventually it was decommissioned and replaced with the skeleton tower. Here's Brant Island Shoal out there in the Pamlico. So you can kind of see on the chart the, how the shoal runs uh, kind of northwest to southeast. Maybe that's not me beeping. Uh, here's, here's a only picture I could find of the Brant Island Shoal. Uh, Harbor Island, uh, that's the one at the north end of Core Sound. Um, this first structure there completed in 1867, discontinued in 1880, but locals protested for reestablishment of a light beacon there. And that's what this article refers to. It says uh, out of the um, Raleigh News of 1880, Lighthouse abandoned. Uh, the following resolutions adopted by a meeting of citizens of Carteret are re requested publication. They will explain themselves. Pursuant to a call, the citizens of Carteret County assembled in large numbers on Cedar Island, August 12, 1880, to take some action in regard to the abandoning of the Harbor Island Lighthouse. So, <clears throat> They were upset that they had done away with, with the lighthouse and let it go in disrepair. So, strip, but it wouldn't be until 1888 that a second structure was completed. And it was built right beside the original one. Uh, and it was, but it was decommissioned in 1929, placed with a skeleton tower. Um, here's a Pamlico point. There's another hexagonal structure. 
a good picture of it. And I wonder if this is the same Coast Guard vessel that was headed out to that, to the other one we saw. It kind of looks like it, but look at this picture. It's pretty cool. Here's a sailboat that's going by. That's one of the boats that might have waved a bottle of whiskey at the lighthouse keeper. Um, being decommissioned and replaced. Now this one, this is the last one I got. This one's interesting and I don't, I included it because they said it was built as a screw pile structure, but it's not over the water. But I still like it. Um, it's a little bit different. And, and I felt bad kind of because I didn't have anything for down around Cape Fear uh, in New Hanover and Brunswick County. Um, and they had light ships there off of Frying Pan Shoals. They had light ships in the river and they didn't get any screw pile lighthouses in the water, but they got this one on land. So I thought I'd add it in here. And it's at Federal Point, you can see uh, right at New Inlet on the east side, north, or north of Cape Fear, uh, built in 1866. And I thought the picture itself was interesting. It's a different structure. I guess it could be bigger because it was built on land. Um, there's a horse there, there's someone there out the grass around. You see the sand dunes in the background uh, and somebody up top there with the tower. So here's a zoom in on, on the location. Uh, and, th and this was another spot that did have a brick lighthouse tower first uh, before it got the screw pile, like actual house type, type building. Uh, and so this chart shows you where it was located uh, now, New Inlet right here eventually filled in, uh, and they filled it in on purpose because engineers were saying that the sand coming in through New Inlet from the ocean side was make, making shoals in the Cape Fear River and hard to navigate the Cape Fear River. Um, the inlet was actually closed in 1881, and they did it by building a breakwater or a, a jetty, basically piling up rocks that went from Federal Point all the way around here to Zeke's Island. And then they added some more eventually to all the way down here. Um, so this was New Inlet. Here's the Cape Fear River. Uh, and that caused New Inlet to fill in and they no longer really needed to mark the, the channel there. Um, unfortunately, that structure was destroyed by a fire in 1881. It would've been pretty cool if it still existed today. Uh, so you already know the answer to this question where you, because I talked about a lot of the, uh, these in the presentation. Where can you see a screw pile lighthouse today? So the original structures, one at Edenton waterfront uh, and one out on Odanthe, although it's hard to really tell what the original part of the lighthouse was. Uh, and then there's the two replica structures, one at Mania waterfront and one at the Plymouth waterfront. Um, so thank you all for spending the last hour of your time with me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I enjoyed putting this together um, and learning more about Screw Pal Lighthouses myself. A lot of people don't give them much thought and it's probably because there's hardly any left. And in the places where you do go see them are kind of tucked away here and there in the lesser known uh, um, spots of coastal North Carolina. Um, I will urge you to come to our next presentation, which is next week, our Creator of Maritime History, David Bennett, will be talking about the historic river fisheries of the Noose River. Um, and he'll have be in a slideshow format as well. And that will be online. Uh, I'm gonna try and see if I have any questions here in the auditorium or anyone online. I see a chat showing up there. So I might try and um, respond to those, but and anybody else here? Otherwise, thanks for coming and enjoy your visit to the museum today. Yes, we got a couple of questions. Thank you. Yes. Can you talk about, can you talk about the different order lights? Uh, what, what exactly is it? Just beta versions or something like that? Uh, like the scale or, or yeah, it was just the size of the lamps. So like first order was the, uh, the biggest and then second, third, fourth, fifth. And I don't know what it went to. Uh, yeah, well, they could put more more lamps inside of it, um, creating more light. Uh, I, I don't know that it projected it any farther. They were it was, but it was able to be brighter because it had more lamps. 
um, it, it, it get, it, inside of those lenses was hollow. You could, you would have the light keeper where if you get up inside of it and mess with the, the, the wicks of the lamps and, and stuff like that, the, 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 the lens was, was just gla glass around it. So the size allowed a bigger, the bigger size lens had a bigger opening, which meant that you could have more, more lamps in it. More lamps meant it could be a brighter light and maybe it shine, you know, projected it farther. But, uh, and, and yes. You mentioned that some were flashing. Yes. I wondered what kind of a mechanism. Uh, in a different pattern. Well, the, the, yeah, similar to Lighthouse Towers, I believe that they had some type of wind up mechanism, uh, whether it was something that, that went, uh, that, that made something go around the lamps. Uh, in some of the Lighthouse Towers, it actually lowered the lamps so that they were not visible and then pulled it back up. So it was a series of, of uh, um, like gears that you would wind up, I guess on a, like a clock. Uh, and it had chains or something that would lower the lamps. You wouldn't see it. So from a distance, it looked like it was flashing, but really the light wasn't going out. It was still lit. It just went down and went back up. Um, so it could have been something similar to that. Well, and along with that, you mentioned that uh, there were some ships ran aground or there was someone that was in distress that that one gentleman was supposed to help them some way. And I wondered, did they use the light to communicate in any way? Like, a, a blinking system. Oh, the the uh, folks at the lighthouse. Yes. Um, no, I I don't I don't think they they would. I think uh, it, it, the way it was set up, if it, it if it was flashing, uh, I think it was kind of set and they couldn't really adjust it too much that quickly and, and do that automatically. I think if it was going to have the appearance of flashing, it had to be set and then left alone. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm kind of just going off of my what I kind of barely know. Maybe, maybe someone else can help me out here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it would have been a, 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 an additional way to determine the difference between the lighthouses. And I, I don't know that it would have been a, a way to, I don't, there wouldn't have been a way to communicate with ships. Um, so if they ran into trouble, the lighthouse keeper had to try to help them the best they could, or at least pull them off of the ship and maybe take them to the lighthouse. Uh, and then they may have to just wait until the, if it was, you know, to a point where then they could go and take them to shore to the nearest life-saving station, if possible. And then that crew, because the life-saving station had a crew of seven people that could really, you know, perform a, a rescue or uh, pull, pulling a ship off of a sandbar. Just two keepers at the lighthouse couldn't do that and take care of it. Um, so they might have just been trying to just do what they could, the best they could. And, and that would have meant maybe taking those people off of a stranded vessel if it was during a storm or not. Yeah, they oh yes, definitely. They, they would be able to communicate, uh, you know, at some point, somehow or another. Um, and, and maybe, you know, I, I need to do more looking into it. I've hardly come across anything that talks about communication between those life-saving stations and the screw pile lighthouses. Um, most of the light towers on land, there was a life-saving station in close proximity, sometimes within a mile or so. So that was a no-brainer. The lighthouse keeper could run to the station and say, hey, you're somewhat in trouble. But when you're 30 miles out in the Pamlico Sound and the nearest life-saving station you know, is that far away, then you know, I don't, I need to learn more about how they were communicating because it would prove to be beneficial for the saving of lives. Uh, that's a good question. We had a question about how many screw pals um, were there for each lighthouse. And I think they had at least seven, uh, sometimes more. We look at this picture, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So a lot of them had about seven or so. Um, 
and that seemed to be enough until they got broken by ice. <laughs> yes. Yes, and that's what I'm working on is getting access to get those those uh, from the U.S. Lighthouse Service uh, archives, uh, which would be with the Coast Guard and maybe with National Archives as well, to uh, get get more in depth and get more details about life in the Screw Pile Lighthouse because that will some some folks have done some looking into that and and published some materials and information about it. It's made. It helps me put this together, but I need to get get some of those documents and read through them uh, myself. Yes, another question. You did mention horrible aspect. So it's used on ships to deploy and uh, pull up the anchor. Uh, it, it it's basically it's from what I understand it's basically just a a uh, something that can be turned. That they can coil the line around. Well, when they have that many people pushing and pulling it you know, at one time, it makes it a lot easier. And I think they can exert more force doing this than you can doing this. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like setting up a pulley, which, you know, the more pulleys you have, the easier something gets. But yes, anything else? There's some good questions and it will prompt me to do more research. So the next time you come, I'll have, I'll, I'll have those answers. So, I mean, uh, thanks again. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I probably missed some of those people and letting them enter the, the Zoom room. It worked out actually. Um, um, go ahead and stop share. Do I need to stop recording or? Well, I just wanted to get you off of Facebook first. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and. Um, um, well, next week, go ahead and hit stop recording. And then next week is.